everybody who goes in dies. Their robots that they send in melt in under eight hours. So they can't stop it. Um, they say it would take them 50 years to stop it, but it's going to kill us all in less than 25 years. And since they admit to 25, I'm thinking 15 maybe before no more children can be born and everything. Um, the experts are saying that this radiation leak is so severe um, and can't be stopped that it's going to irradiate and uh, kill everything on the planet within 25 years. Now, that's bad. <laughs> I mean, that's really bad. That means, you know, even, even though I'm, you know, 50 years old, I have children, grandchildren. You know, I hope to have great grandchildren who live here on the earth. And so the extinction of the human race within 25 years doesn't sound like a very good option. Well, that's why we have the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his network. CUBN TV is his network. Uh, Believer's Central World Update is his show, as are all the shows on CUBN TV. And we're lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to you with a message of hope. Yeah, there's a lot of really bad things happening out there. But you know what? We have hope in Jesus. He's going to come and rescue us. And it looks to me like he's going to be just in time because as we have poisoned our planet now to where and driven ourselves to the brink of self-extinction with the foolery of nuclear power, which we can see, you know, this tsunami messed up that nuclear plant and now it's poisoning us all to death. So... <laughs> Jesus offers us hope. He has said when he left, he was going to go prepare a place for us. In John 14, 1 through 3, it says, let not your heart be troubled. See, he knew we'd be afraid when we, these things were coming on us and we could see them. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So see, he's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He has built us a city, and the scripture says that we look for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The city, the new Jerusalem has everything necessary to sustain mortal human life. Fresh air, fresh water, has um, houses, clothing, uh, food. You know, spirits and dead people have no need for these things. These things are necessary to sustain mortal human life, which is what we are now. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes for us, He's going to take us alive. Just like you will live here once again on the earth, on a perfect earth that's beautiful and reborn and wonderful again like the garden of eden was see we look around at the earth now and we think wow you know the beauty but we haven't seen beauty yet i mean what we think is really beautiful what we look around and see here on the earth what we think is really beautiful is actually what the earth is under the curse and to its worst extent, we're, it's all, I mean, we are at the brink here where the earth is about to renew itself again. And we've, um, we must be evacuated before these things come. 
the scriptures. Um, we will take a show sometime and go into all of the scriptures that show, without a doubt, that there is a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, what this event is, is we can glean information from previous raptures in the scriptures. That's how we know anything is the scriptures. That's our final authority, and that's that's where the buck stops is with the scriptures. Now, we know that there have been raptures in the past, and there has even been a mass rapture in the past. Um, Enoch in the book of Genesis was the first person to be raptured. What that means is that God saw Enoch walking on the earth, reached down and snatched him up and took him alive and took him to heaven. Now, Enoch is still alive, mortally still alive. It, you know, when God picked him up and took him to heaven, it didn't kill him. He, he's still alive just like he was 6,000 years ago when he was walking the earth in the book of Genesis. He was pleasing to God, and God took him, and I guess they're friends, you know, and Abraham is also God's friend. But God took Enoch alive, and that's exactly what's going to happen in the rapture, we have another example as well. <coughs> Excuse me. We have another example as well. Uh, Elijah. Troy, I've got an um, echo here in my headset, but I just want to let you know that when I hear the music, I'll know that my break is coming. Okay. All right. Now, Elijah was also raptured, okay? The scripture says in 2 Kings that a heavenly whirlwind, a chariot of fire came down out of the sky and between Elijah and Elisha snagged Elijah and took off with him. We have Elijah has been taken to heaven alive mortally alive and there's a reason for that um elijah enoch possibly as well um will be back when the lord jesus christ comes to evacuate the believers and the children these two witnesses come with him and they will stay here and they are known as the two witnesses in the book of revelation and they will train the 144,000 which in Revelation chapter 7, it talks about who the 144,000 are. They are 12,000 young Jewish evangelists who receive Christ as their Savior after the rapture, and the two witnesses will train them. They are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as our uh, live shows here are recorded, and they go into archives. I'm hoping that I can maybe embed some scriptures for you so you can see them on the screen. I don't know if that will work or not, but we're, we're working on it. We'll see how it goes there too, okay, so we can get you the scriptures or you can see them. Um, who else was raptured? Let's talk about that. The next one was the Lord Jesus Christ, and we had... Um, no, I'm sorry. The next one, yes, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. Um, was the next one. And um, now the Lord, he was raised up visibly. He, um, people saw him ascend into the clouds. And they were just like, wow. And these angels said, you know, why do you stand there gazing into heaven? The same Jesus who you see going will return in like manner as you're seeing him go. So that's one possibility for uh, the method of our transportation to the holy city. And then you have the heavenly vehicle that came for Elijah. And then Enoch, we don't, I don't really know of any um, specifics that say what method he was taken by, but the scripture in Genesis says that he was he walked with God and then all of a sudden he was not, for God took him. 
So you have the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. After the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, well, let's, let's go back to Jesus because he's the next one. Um, Jesus, Jesus, when he died on the cross for us, descended into the lower parts of the earth and then preached the gospel to those who were dead uh, in paradise, which was... Um, a compartment. It's given in some detail in Luke chapter 16. Um, before Jesus came, nobody could enter heaven. So when the when someone died, whether they were righteous or unsaved, they both went down, okay, uh, into this compartment to wait. And one side was called torments. The other side was called paradise or Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus died on the cross, he descended into the lower parts, into um, this compartment, and preached the gospel to the dead righteous who were in paradise. And then when he rose from the dead, he brought them with him. So they also were resurrected or raised like Lazarus. See, those saints who were waiting in paradise, when Jesus was raised, the scripture tells us, that many others were raised when he was and that they were reunited with their bodies. They were more walking around like mortals again. People recognized them. They walked into Jerusalem and talked to people. There were about 500 witnesses to these events. And so you have, that is a mass rapture right there because although it doesn't specifically say that um, they were raptured. It doesn't, it, it says that Jesus took them with him um, or, or else they're still walking around alive on the planet somewhere. So, you know, well, I, I don't know. I, I would hesitate to think that, but, you know, we've got uh, the Apostle Paul. He was raptured and trained specifically by the Lord Jesus Christ to reach out to the Gentiles. Then you've got Philip. He was speaking to the eunuch in uh, the book of Acts, and God took him suddenly, picked him up off the planet, set him down in another location over at Azatoth. Or, uh, yeah, Azatoth, I think. And... Astaroth. There we go. Anyway, um, so you have another form of a rapture there where God picked Philip up from his presence there with the eunuch and then set him down again in another completely different location on the earth, still alive. So God's showing that he can just snatch us with Enoch. With Elijah, he can send some kind of a vehicle, a chariot of fire for us. He's showing that with um, that there can be a mass rapture with all of those who are resurrected with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is showing us with Paul that he can pull any of us he chooses into his presence and teach us and convince us of anything he wants to um, because he sure made a believer out of the Apostle Paul, didn't he? And then you have Philip, which shows us another aspect of God's capabilities where moving people around alive is concerned because he took Philip from his conversation there with the eunuch and moved him over to another location on the earth and sent him back down again. I bet that was a trip. I bet he didn't know what to think about that. I, I bet it was fun, though. You know what? I bet it was a blast. Then, anyway, after... After Philip, you've also got John. Now, John is fascinating because in the book of Revelation, John was taken not only into heaven, but also into heaven's future and earth's future, and then brought back to his own time to write about these things. 
So God has shown us too. He can take us into the future. He can take us uh, into heaven's future, earth's future. Bring us right back. He's not limited at all, and he and, it, and set us back down alive again. We don't die just because he picks us up and takes us somewhere. So as we can see, um, the rapture is the catching away of living people who remain alive and are returned alive after the cataclysmic events of the tribulation period uh, come upon the earth. It's going to be, once these events start to happen, um, I think from what I know of the scriptures that they may probably happen um, quite quite quickly um, once they start. Now this, Israel seems to believe that the wars will last for 30 days. I don't know, you know, how they figure on that or whatever, but according to the tetrads of blood moons that have happened in the past, every time Israel fights a war where they gain more of the Holy Lands, um, you have these tetrads of blood moons that show up on Tabernacle and, I mean, on uh, Passover, excuse me, and Tabernacles two years in a row. <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting a catch in my throat. I talk too much, don't I? <laughs> Sorry. I do have a lot to say, though. It's funny, I'm constantly wanting to tell people about these things. And my poor family, they put up with me so much. I am constantly just, you know, thank you, Lord, for giving me a forum where I can get all of this out of my system because the Lord just drives me to teach sometimes. And I really needed a forum to do that where somebody might listen to what I'm trying to say. I've been having, um, t you know, teaching on Facebook day in and day out, day all day, all night, you know, 20 hours a day, something like that for like almost three years now. And thank God I can now just get in front of a camera and say it and uh, save my fingers and all of that time I might actually get a family life. But let's go back to the rapture. What the rapture is, is the, is our evacuation. Because see, we've got We've got some really bad things coming. Like we just talked about Fukushima Daiichi. All by itself, it's going to kill us all. That's without any meteor hitting us or anything like that, which we know a meteor does hit the planet uh, with the second trumpet judgment. Then immediately after that, with the third trumpet judgment, you've got a comet that will explode in our atmosphere up by our um, Arctic, which is going to poison the planet's fresh water supply. So we've got some serious, serious events coming, even without Fukushima going to kill us all in 25 years. Um, we don't know any timing for these coming events until the rapture occurs. Now, once you have the rapture occur, then you're looking at, from what I can tell, and I'm not a prophet, okay? I'm just a Bible student and a teacher. I can make educated guesses about some of these things and present you with scriptural possibilities, but I don't make predictions. I can't, you know, I'm not a prophet. I'm not a psychic, anything like that. I'm just a student and a teacher. So I am pretty familiar somewhat with the scriptures, and... The prophecies, I've been studying for 25 years now, and I compare them to current events that happen in the world and then assess which prophecies and which current events uh, match up with no zero errors, okay? We have a zero errors standard here, and when, when they match up, um, and I can't find any disqualifying factor, then I present them to you as a scriptural possibility 
And we look at the scriptures and discuss them and, you know, uh, just see what we can put our heads together on these things because there are several different scenarios that would fit into the scriptures and until we um, actually see an event occur, we have no idea, you know, we know the order it is on in the timeline, but we don't know exactly its position on the timeline. So right now where we stand is we are in the last few, in my professional opinion, we're in the last, you know, few days, if you will. And when I say days, it could be, you know, even a couple of years. I don't really think it will be that long, but it could be, you know. We just we just take the possibilities as they come, and then we, um, we watch, we pray, we seek the Lord, we learn the Word, and we just wait on Him to come for us. Now, we've been waiting and watching on Kaduri's prophecy. Um, I've been talking a lot about this on my wall, and then when um, I was in, appeared as a guest on Jim Cipriani's uh, Watching for Truth Lord show, we were talking about uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri and his prophecy. Now, he prophesied the month of Av for the Messiah to return. Well, that is going to be over as of tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, it's a, this may be another one of those that comes and goes. But I was really, really hoping for this one. I still am. I mean, I'm hopeful every day. Okay? I'm not going to be disappointed or devastated or anything like that if Kaduri's prophecy comes and goes because, you know, I, that's what I do. I watch for these things. I watch them come and go and... Um, when the right one comes, it won't come and go. It, it will actually happen. So these events are coming. The next one to expect is the rapture of the believers. Now, how this will happen, we just don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. You know, we have scriptural precedent for vanishing into thin air like Philip did. We have precedent for some kind of chariot of fire, uh, heavenly vehicle or whatever to come down for us out of the sky, you know. But what, I mean, what I think, what we do know is what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18 tells us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, he's saying that the Lord himself, Jesus, is personally coming, so we know this isn't one of the harvests where the reapers are sent, like it talks about in uh, Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Or is it 1329? I'm sorry, I'm not really good with the references. I can quote you the scriptures a lot, but I can't remember the references as well. But I will try to post those on our videos before they go to YouTube. I don't know if I'll be able to edit, you know, the networks thing or not. I I might be able to add some scriptures over the top of the screen. You know, I'll, I'll see how that works. But um, the Lord himself is coming for the rapture saints. Now the rapture saints are those who have believed Lord Jesus Christ, received him as our savior and trust him to save us. Okay? It is not our salvation prior to the rapture is not based on works in any way shape or form. It's pure grace. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and it's his blood alone shed for us. It's his sacrifice singularly that saves us. So, you know, don't go expecting believers to be perfect, okay? I all of us, we have our we have our sins. We we can't 
um, we can't keep from sinning in some ways. We can get to where we sin less, you know, and as we obey the word and, um, and we do sin less, then we have an even greater challenge to face by fighting self-righteousness as we are walking with the Savior and, and obeying Him and things like that, then when you're doing that, you, you are da- in danger of falling into self-righteousness and considering yourself in better standing with God than someone else. And we can never think that. Never think that. Um, the Scripture says that we must consider others better than ourselves. And if... And that's so liberating. You know, that I have to share this one with you because for me personally, when I discovered that everybody else is better than me, wow, that's awesome. That's so liberating because then you don't have to compete with anyone else. You don't have to measure yourself by other people um, and, and look at someone else's life and think, Oh, my life is just so messed up compared to theirs. You don't have to do that, you know, because the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. He shed his blood. And if any of us could do it on our own, he died for nothing. And that's impossible. You don't die for nothing when you are the creator of all things. I I, I think about that a lot, you know, about why, why he died for me you know I think about wow what what is it that you know is so important about us as human beings that he would come and die for us wow well it's not because he wants servants he's got Tons of angels for servants. He didn't have to die for them either. What is it about us that made him feel like we are valuable enough to die for? It amazes me. It truly amazes me. I think about when something is valuable to you, I mean, there's a lot of things that are valuable to me that I wouldn't die for. But for my daughters, my grandbabies, yes, I would lay my life down for theirs in a harpy. And it's because I love them so much, there's nothing I wouldn't do to preserve them and save their lives if it was within my power to do so. And that makes me think about how maybe the Lord feels the same about us. That when you're willing to die for something, it's because you can't live without it. You don't want to live without it. I mean, how, how precious must we be? to our king that he would lay down his life and die for us I'm really looking forward to learning the depths of these kinds of questions you'll get to know me as you hopefully tune in each day from 3 to 5 central 4 to 6 eastern and we'll talk about these things and we'll go into a lot of depth and and we will um We'll learn the Word of God together and and explore the Lord's personality and get to know Him so you can so you can feel like you know Him as well because we do need to get to know the Lord. You can pick up on His personality in the Scriptures when you're listening to the Word or reading the Word. You can hear when He's happy, when He's disgusted or insulted or angry or frustrated. You know, God has all of these emotions, which is why we have them. You're not going to have a single emotion that God didn't have first. Okay? So, even the evil things He created 
to give us a contrast between evil and good. But I'm, I'm really looking forward to the rapture because it's, the, it's God's method to preserve the human race from extinction. See what we've done? We've already done it. We have, through our own foolishness as humans and messing with nuclear power, um, now we're all going to die. If there isn't a God and if Jesus isn't real and if he doesn't come back and rescue us and renew the earth, we're all toast. We're all going to die because of, of uh, Fukushima Daiichi. So if you've never considered God before, perhaps this is a good time to start because if he's going to show up, and he is, it's going to be soon before we all die. Okay? He's taking us alive, and we know that because otherwise what's the point of coming? You know, I mean, if we all die, we would all die and go to him, right? He's coming because he's going to preserve us alive. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to preserve the human race. And he's going to. He's going to come and he's going to evacuate all of the babies and little children. And it doesn't matter if you as their parent are believers or not. Those little children are covered under the Lord's protection that are under the age of accountability. And they will be taken from you. If you don't walk with the Lord, you better say goodbye to him. And if you, uh, because any day soon... We are in, uh, and not just because of Kaduri's prophecy. I mean, even, that can come and go. But we are getting really close to the rapture of the believers. I'm completely convinced of that more and more each day as I see more and more signs happening in the sun, the moon, the stars, and in the world around us. But we don't have to fear. The Lord is going to rescue us. And we're going to go and live in his beautiful city that he's created for us. He's going to take, uh, he's going to take the believers and the children by the millions. We will just the planet. And if you lose children, loved ones, um, don't, you know, it's going to be scary for you if you're still here, if you haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. But just know this, that if you are missing children and people that you love, that they're not dead, you know, we're not dead, it's all going to be okay. And so, anyway, we're going to go to a break and it looks, it kind of looks like we're going to go to a break. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. Turn it. Are we on talking to each other like this? <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing and hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. goodness shines through, I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing and hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Your love is 
World Update on CUBN Network. God bless you all. I haven't been able to get to the chat room yet. I should go over there and see if you guys have got questions. I'm sorry I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Hi, everybody in the chat room. Okay, I may have had an echo there. Let's see. Uh oh. Let me, um, hmm, say what? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. I can't really hear anything. Okay. All right. Here we are. Live television. Sorry, guys. Let's look at the chat room and see how many questions we've got here. Do we have anybody that's got questions? Let's see. Welcome to... Hey, Sherry. Hi. Graceful Joy One. I love you. I'm glad to see you. Hey, Rom. Rom 5, we've got Dante 1028, and Shep Chap, um, let's see, we've got several in the chat room, hi Janine, hi, good to see you sweetie, a lot of my Facebook friends where I teach over there coming over, hey, we've got uh, 
do you guys have any questions over in the chat room? I'll be glad to answer your questions. Oh, hi, sweetie. I love you, too. Oh, my goodness. Let's see. Dante has a huge question that I am going to have to put my glasses on to be able to see. Sorry about the glare, guys. I've got some glasses ordered that have the coating where you don't have to see the uh, glare off my glasses. We'll, but we'll have to deal with it for now for me to see this little tiny print. Let's see here. Dante1028 says... My question is, if Paul spoke of being caught up, and Jesus says in Matthew 24, 29, that he, let's see, i got to move this around, that he returns after the great tribulation. Okay, Paul spoke of being caught up, and Jesus says in Matthew 24, 29, that he returns after the great tribulation. Isn't that what Paul was talking about? I know some dispensationalists also refer to Revelation chapter 4, 19, where we see the church is not present. But does that mean the church is in heaven being were not mentioned? Couldn't it also mean we may not be there yet? Another thing I heard you say was we will be taking out the way of God's wrath. But in Revelation six seventeen, it says God's wrath is come present tense. I don't know what you're talking about there. But let me go ahead and take... The first part of uh, what you had to say here about um, you you say Jesus says in Matthew twenty four twenty nine that he returns after the great tribulation. Well, let's go look at Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Um, let's see. Let's look at it and uh, see exactly what it says. And get it in its context and explain that scripture. Okay, let's take uh, 28 and 29 and 30 so we can establish our context, okay? Um, 28 is, for so wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The tribulation, um, the word used in, the word tribulation used in this context in Matthew 24, 29, means trouble rather than Daniel's 70th week, which is the tribulation period. There are places where the scripture does use the word differently. But in this, in this particular verse, it means trouble. And now, this, it is the trouble of the last days. So it may very well occur during the tribulation. Because if we look at the elements of the scripture, we can identify exactly where it fits on the timeline. So let's look, it says, after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, to me, this sounds very much like the sixth seal judgment. So let's go over to the book of Revelation to the sixth seal judgment and let's see if it looks like we've got a match there okay we're buzzing over here to revelation chapter six is where we see the seals begin to be opened all right now down here at revelation chapter six verse twelve and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. Now that sounds, uh, verse 13, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So it, it sounds to me, like the 
this verse that you're talking about here, Dante, does occur during the tribulation period um, or before. Now, well, it has to occur during the tribulation period, but it doesn't actually mean tribulation. Not, it's not saying after the tribulation. It's saying after the tribulation of those days. So then you have to find out what days. And the sixth seal judgment comes at just after the midpoint of the tribulation period. Because after the rapture occurs, you will have the opening of the first four seals, which completes the harvest of the tares. Then the treaty, um, I'm sorry, after the wars and the harvest of the tares, Israel begins burning weapons for seven years, according to Isaiah. And that seven years ends at the tribulation midpoint, the actual seven-year tribulation. Now, so you have the rapture, then you have the wars, then you have Israel burning weapons for three and a half years, then you have the treaty between Israel and the many signed, which officially starts the tribulation period. Then you have three and a half years of no judgments from God falling. The seal judgments are um, suspended during that first three and a half years. And this is when the Antichrist will rise to power and everyone's proclaiming him the Messiah. He's... Um, instituting his, you know, he's taking control of the world government. He is instituting his new economic system, which uses the Mark of the Beast technology with some kind of an electronic scannable device in your hand or forehead. Um, and the world will seem during those three and a half years, like it is actually about to get back on its feet. It, the scripture says that craft will prosper in the hands of the Antichrist and that he will cause the world to kind of get back up on its feet again. Um, during that time, there is no judgments falling. So then when you get into three and a half years past the start of the tribulation. See, when the treaty is signed, that's the official start of the tribulation period, the seven-year tribulation. That treaty is going to enable the Jews to rebuild their temple on the Temple Mount. And during that time, they will resume the daily sacrifices and the temple rituals and worship and during that first three and a half years, things are going to kind of go back to some semblance of normal for the people that are left behind. And it will seem like the world is beginning to prosper and uh, the people think, yay, peace is finally here. But what happens at the midpoint of the tribulation period, Israel stops burning those weapons because the Antichrist is assassinated with a mortal head wound, and he is dead for three days. At the same time this is happening, you have Satan being cast down from heaven, um, which we see detailed in Revelation and in Isaiah, where he falls like lightning from heaven during that time. The accuser of the brethren is cast down, and he will resurrect the body of the Antichrist and walk around inside of it like an avatar. And so then you've got the devil himself inside a human body walking around, and that is the image of the beast. When the devil is in the Antichrist's body, he is going to require all those who have taken the mark to bow down and worship him. And... He, or he will kill you. And those who up to that point have refused to take the mark of the beast, it will then become mandatory for them. And they will, um, they will face arrest and execution if they do not take the mark at that point. 
um, the Bible is specific that there are 10 days for the saints from the time of their capture to the time of their execution. And this is important. I'm glad that, you know, the Lord knew that the tribulation saints would need to know that because you can only hold out for so long, you know, when you're under mental, psychological, and physical torture. You can only you can only stand for so long. And the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to make the tribulation saints uh, stand indefinitely. He um, has declared it's a 10-day thing. And if you can stand through those 10 days and lay your neck on the chopping block, you'll make it home. So, unfortunately... Those who find themselves here in the tribulation period are going to have to lay down their lives uh, for their faith in Christ. They're going to have to put their money where their mouth is. It's kind of like this. Um, Jesus came and said, I love you. Mankind said, prove it. So he laid his life down and, and died for us. And those who have not believed him, not received his wonderful sacrifice that he paid so dearly to purchase for us, will be left behind. And as they find themselves left behind, they will say to the Lord, I love you. And he will say, prove it. And they will have to lay down their lives for him. And, oh, dear they will have to walk the walk. You can, you know, right now, before the rapture, we're, we're on pure grace right now. All we, that is required of us is to choose the Lord Jesus Christ and to love him and trust him and count on him completely to save us. And since he is God in a human body, he is able to save us. And when this wonderful event occurs, all of the children, every baby, every young child, all the way up to the age of accountability, will be taken suddenly uh, to safety. The Lord Jesus Christ is not going to risk these precious ones um, and leave them here. He's going to take them to the holy city where they'll be safe. Because after we leave and evacuate, the bad things start coming on the earth. Just boom, 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 boom. And it's just going to be a terrible thing. Um, and the Lord is not willing to subject the little children to that. And so he's taking them to safety. And he will return them, all of us uh, who go in the rapture, we will be returning. Unlike the, you know, fictional left behind movies and books tell you that, you know, they're gone forever. No, we are not gone forever. We are taken alive. We're in a different location, you know, while the things are happening on the earth that are so cataclysmic and the earth goes through its renewal process. And then we will return after this process is over and it's safe to come back and live here again. The Lord Jesus is going to clean the place up. He's going to take care of Fukushima Daiichi and clean it up. He is going to take care of the toxic waste and the nuclear weapons and the the terrible chemicals in our water and our air and our food. We've poisoned ourselves as man has administrated his authority under the influence of Satan on this planet. And the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to uh, take his own. Those who he, uh, who have trusted in him and those who are unaccountable and he will take us to safety and when the um, terrible things that are coming upon the earth have passed and it's safe to return again, he will bring us back. You know, kind of like he did Noah and his family. And I know people think that we're crazy too. Just imagine. I, I can see. I, I can see perfectly logically why the people thought Noah was nuts. It had never rained before. Ever. 
the people had never seen water fall from the sky. The Bible says that the earth was watered by a mist that came up through the ground prior to that time. And when uh, Noah was telling these people that water was going to fall out of the sky and drown them all, they thought he was insane. He's building a huge boat, 200 miles from any body of water. He's spending 120 years with him and his three sons and building this boat. And there's no water that people can see. And he says, God's going to flood the earth. Get on the ark. And you know how many people listened and got on the ark? None. Not a zip. Not a single person who watched him build this boat for 120 years and who heard him give the warnings. Not a single soul got on the ark. So when the things that the Bible tells us about seem crazy to you, expect that. Expect that. Do you know that all of those people who didn't listen to Noah who seemed insane, they, they died, all of them. There's not a single descendant of theirs on the planet anymore. Noah and his family were the only ones that lived, and all of us, every single human being on the planet is descended from Noah and his family. If Noah hadn't been you know, willing to obey God and stand in the face of all those who thought he was crazy, insane, they teased and mocked him and scoffed at him the entire time he was building the boat. And if you would have been there, which do you think you would have done? Would you have gotten on the ark? Or would you have laughed and scoffed too? It, what, he's, what Noah was telling the people just seemed impossible to them. Um, let's see. Let me get back over to the chat room here. <laughs> I think I answered Dante's question and then just kind of went on and on and on with it, didn't I? <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me find you guys again. Uh, let me find you. Okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, oh, yes, Graceful Joy won. That's my Sherry. She would have gotten on the ark. I would have, too. I would have, too. Oh, come on, you guys. Do you have any other questions? Let's see. Yeah, it says in scripture as of the days of Noah. Oh, somebody's asking me, Lisa, why did you choke on saying Jesus is Lord when Jim asked you? <laughs> because I had two or three voices going off in my head at the same time through my headphones, and I couldn't tell what was coming from where at the time. But I jumped in there. Jesus is Lord. Let me just say that. Jesus is Lord. He is my life. He is my true love. And he is everything. So if, maybe that will clear it up for you. Okay. Um, you want to know, Anon 5984 says, can we ignore Nibiru now? Yes, I think we can ignore it until it shows up in the sky. I think so. Um, let's see. Do the rapture saints watch the tribulation saints? I'm not sure if they do or not. I, I don't know. Um, we might be too busy um, going to the wedding supper and having a good time and being reunited with our loved ones who have gone before us to be watching what's going on on the earth. But I don't know if we can or not. That's That'll be interesting. Let's see. 
Uh, Dante said, Lisa, I was asking Grace about the seven-year peace treaty. Um, we're not in the peace treaty yet. Now, when the peace treaty is actually signed, it'll be between Israel and the many, and they will actually say peace, safety. The, whole, the scripture indicates that the world will be rejoicing and proclaiming the Antichrist the Messiah because he's been able to pull off this peace that nobody has been able to. And you see how far back. I mean, we've got more than 20 years back uh, going clear back to Oslo. You know, that was obviously Oslo was not the tribulation period because it, the Lord would have returned within seven years. And it's been 20 years. So obviously, you know, that's not the not the right uh, treaty. Yeah, we, I think so too. Rom 5, we're going to be at the wedding supper. Um, let's see. I'm trying to read you guys. Um, taking pictures of the sun, nothing there. I didn't see anything either, guys. I, I mean, I've heard that Nibiru was supposed to pass today, but I don't see anything. <laughs> and if this thing, you know, is as huge as what they say, then, you know, you should be able to see it in the sky, I would think. I'm not going to, you know, I can't look up in the sky and see nothing and think a, you know, <laughs> a moon-sized planet is going to whiz by us today when you can't even see it in the sky. So, I don't know. I'm thinking Nibiru's a no-show. What do you think? Now, you know, if this thing, when this thing does, you know, actually show up, if it exists or whatever, you know, um, oh, you think I'm mean? Let me see. Why, Lisa, why are you so mean? You only show love to people that kiss up to you. That is not Christian. That's not true. I, t I cater to everybody. You know, I'm sitting here reading your comment and you're calling me names. So, obviously, that's not true. I, re you know, I read everyone's um, comments if I see them. You know, I, there is such a volume um, let's see. Such a volume of people a lot of times asking me questions that I just, I just don't see them all. You know, I, I answer the ones that I see. And, um, <laughs> I'm sorry you think I'm mean. I mean, maybe, maybe I do come across as mean when people come to, for the purpose of starting dissension and strife, because I don't allow that kind of thing. I'm not going to cater to people that want to come on anonymously and just, you know, sling mud and things like that. I see no reason to, I see no reason whatsoever to cater to people who are here to cause strife and, and to disrespect the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I you know, <laughs> If people want to ask me a question, you know, that's a real question and is not, you know, spitting it in my face when they ask it, I don't mind answering. And, and I can even put up with those who do, you know, say terrible things to me. But I don't, I don't have to put up with it indefinitely. If somebody wants to show up and call me names fine, they can call me names, I can, I'll get over it, the Lord Jesus said to expect that, but that doesn't mean I have to let them stick around on my wall or in my chat room to continue to call me names, you know, so this isn't a democracy here, you know, you're welcome to say what you want to say on the chat room wall, and, and if I want to read your question and answer it, I will, and if I don't want to, I won't, so that's just the way it works, so you know, if you guys, uh, I'm here to win the loss to the Lord Jesus Christ and not to cater to believers who don't study. You know, it, believers need to study and not just get all their information from another human being. 
I, I try to teach and disciple believers on my wall on Facebook, and I hope to do the same here on this broadcast. But there does come a certain point where people do have to study and verify, you know, these things for themselves. You just, you can't, um, you can't ride the coattails of someone else to get into heaven unless it's Jesus, okay? You ride his coattails to get into heaven, nobody else. And so even though I can share with you and kind of spoon feed the word to you of what I've learned over the years, it's really important that you get in your Bible yourself and study and verify everything. That's why I post the scriptures with everything I teach because otherwise – what I have to say is is just mere opinion. It doesn't even matter. The word is the authority. And so that's why we post the word. And, and I'll try not to be mean to you, okay? <laughs> I, I don't mean to be mean to anybody. So, you know, I, I'm human like everybody else, though. So we'll, if, if I seem like I'm in a weird mood or mean or something, you know, just jot me a note and I'll, I'll see if I can't. You know, slap, snap myself out of it and stuff. I'm just human, so remember that, you know, as we're going through here, because I don't claim to be any better than anyone else. The word says that we're to consider everyone else better than ourselves. Let me find that scripture. I think that we should look at that scripture. Let's see. I think that would be a good scripture to look. If we're obedient to the word... We are considering everyone else better than ourselves. And and that's when I deal with people, you know, I have to assume they've studied longer than I have. I have to assume that they have prayed more than I have, that they're um, a far better person than I am and that they know God better than me. But you know what? That is so liberating. It's wonderful. I think I may have taught this before about how once, you know, if you consider everyone else better than you, then you don't have to compete with people. It's very liberating because you're not comparing yourselves with other people. And we talked about that earlier, but I do want to give you the scripture here. Let's see. Um, All right, here we go. It's Philippians. Chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. And if we do that, it's so liberating because you're not, you're not competing with other people for anything. You know, you're, um, <laughs> you're not fighting to constantly keep yourself on a pedestal. You're on the ground below everybody else looking up at everybody else. So it really is a very freeing and liberating thing because you don't worry about things and you don't worry about your pace. You don't worry about anything when you know you're in last place, do you? God knew exactly what he was talking about on that one. Let's see. Okay. All right, let's Let's see here. Let's go back and see if we've got some more questions in the chat room. I really appreciate you guys coming and watching the show so much. I've been so nervous to do a a live broadcast because, you know, it's not something that uh, I ever aspired to do. But I asked the Spirit to give me a, a voice to... Tell the world that he's coming and that he's real and that he loves us and to reach out to the lost. And I thought I already had that as we were teaching on Facebook and discipling believers in 172 countries and on YouTube. But I didn't think it could get any bigger than that. But now I get to tell the whole world on 102 stations that... uh, World, you know, live every day around the world that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and that He's coming, and He is. He's coming. And 
we don't know exactly when. You know, Kaduri's prophecy ends tomorrow. I'm kind of, you know, it would be just like the Lord to come at the very last minute. But I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. He's really patient, you know. I, there is a big part of me that kind of expects Kaduri's prophecy to just come and go tomorrow, you know. Um since we're right here at the very end of it. But it is very much like our king to wait until the very last second and then come because he is so patient with us. He's long-suffering, according to the scriptures, not willing that any should perish and that all would come to salvation, to saving faith in him. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, let me encourage you to seek him he's real he's real like you and i are real he's got a body a flesh just like we do he looks human just like we do he is a human when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection he said touch me see you could see and feel the scars in his hands and in his feet and in his side. But he was alive, flesh and bone, real, touchable, can talk to you, eat with you, laugh with you, hang out with you, real, okay? After he died and was resurrected, he hung out for 40 days and taught the people after he rose from the dead. So, the Lord Jesus Christ is God in a human body. Now ask yourself, what do you expect of God? Okay, let's say if, if God is, I'll, I'll tell you from my own way of thinking about it. What, you know, how, how do we know um, that, God is, that God is telling us the truth? Well, He's established that for us. He, he knew we would need some way to consider him credible. You know what I mean? He, that's why he gave us 3,500 years of 100% accurate human history ahead of time. So we could have 3,500 years of verifiable human history that has been given to us accurately. That way we can see over 3,500 years that, number one, yes, he's correct. He knows the future because the events happen exactly as foretold. For two, he's in control of it as well because not only does he foretell events, he foretells the outcome of events. So all of, you know, 3,500 years of accurate prophecies, which are easily verifiable by secular historical record, that's incredible. 100% accuracy over 3,500 and uh, what is it, 67 years or something like that. It's, it's incredible. Not one single error or contradiction. So it's, un it's completely unreasonable in my opinion, to think that the 3,500-year uh, consistent pattern is going to suddenly change. Yeah, I think that's unreasonable to think that. If it's been consistent for 3,500 years, then I think we can expect it to be consistent for the last, you know, 15 years or whatever we've got here prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know the rapture is very, very soon. Um, we know this for several reasons, and mostly because we see tribulation events materializing and manifesting before our eyes that do not come to their fruition until the rapture occurs and the um, tribulation period begins. Um, Let's see. Let me go back over here to the chat room. I'm sorry I can't walk and chew gum at the same time, guys. I'm I am having to go back and forth between the chat room because I. Okay, let's see. Um, any questions, guys? Let's see. 
Let's see. My chat room thinks I should boot somebody out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let me find him and <laughs> How do I do that? Uh, okay, it says to me that enough people, if, if enough people flag a certain user, he or she will be kicked from the group. So if you have a problem with someone's comments, just go ahead and flag them. Um, there's a little thing to the right there let's see oh yes thank you um thank you brooker uh yeah i can handle the babies it's okay It's okay. I can handle it when people want to call me names or say ugly things. I'm good with that. It doesn't bother me at all. The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I'm just trying to figure out. Let's see. Um, 777 Giant Slayer. Lisa, can you speak on Obama being the leopard? And what's the deal with the – what's that say? Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> I'm going to have to put them on. I can't see that little print. Let's see. Okay, what's the deal with the flies always around him and <laughs> the infestation of flies in the White House? Are you serious? <laughs> I didn't know. I've never heard that there's flies around him. <laughs> or flies in the White House. I've never heard that before. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know. I I have no idea. Well, what I can tell you is that the Antichrist right now is walking in around the position, okay? is walking around in the shoes of the American president and the British prime minister, okay? They are the leaders of the, re of the West. Uh, let's see. Let me answer a quickie question here to our producer. Okay, um... Let's see. <laughs> oh, okay. Obama, he's not the Antichrist. It doesn't mean he won't be eventually, but he's not right now. Okay? They're, the Antichrist is not. The Antichrist is alive and well and walking around out there. And it is possible it could be Obama, but he's not the Antichrist yet. The Antichrist doesn't know who he is yet. See, when the first seal is opened after the rapture of the believers, you have the opening of the seven seals first. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who is found worthy to open the seals and to release these judgments. He opens the first seal. It is the Antichrist. Let's look at, um, let's look at the scripture that tells us about the first seal being open. It's in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. Okay. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, 
and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. A spirit is released by the first seal judgment when it is opened by the Lord Jesus Christ. A spirit emerges from this opening and chooses a man resting upon him and basically possessing him and he will become the Antichrist at that time. All these world leaders right now, though what they believe is that the spirit of Osiris, their false god, their Baal, if you will, they bow down before a 40-foot stone owl like a bunch of primitive savages sacrificing things and spilling blood on the altar and chanting all kinds of crazy medieval stuff. I know it seems nuts. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. That um, Alex Jones. I don't, you know, I, I think Alex is awesome, but um, I don't listen to a lot of his stuff because it, it takes a long time, you know, for him. It's it's a whole report thing, so it kind of takes a while to get get around to the things that I was interested in listening to. But Alex is um, he's pretty courageous. But one thing, uh, what I was going to tell you about these world leaders. Now, they all understand these prophecies as well. They are looking forward to this time when the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ will be evacuated. They, uh, they know the rapture is coming. Yes, they know about it. And they're really looking forward to it as much as we are because then they get to have their way. See, right now, the believers are the authority on the planet. And so they're looking forward to getting us out of the way so they can do things their way. You know, we've, we're the ones with the authority, so they can't really get around us. They, they, they're pretty creative, but they're looking forward to their chance to run things. Wickedness is. And so, so they're looking forward to us leaving. But when um, these world leaders believe that a spirit is coming, the spirit of Osiris will come from their perspective, will come and choose one of them and rest upon him and will make him the new world leader, the the Antichrist. And they're all looking forward to this. They all want to be chosen as this world leader who's going to be all powerful. And, you know, only one will be chosen. So we can't really know who that is right now, but we can tell um, that Obama and um, the British Prime Minister right now are in a very interesting position because we have the Egyptian president, Mohammed Mursi, who is very likely the Islamic Mahdi from the scriptures. He is the one who seems to be rallying the Arabs for the war that will come against Israel. See, when you have the rapture, then the Antichrist is chosen by the Spirit. Then you have the second seal judgment, which is war. And then this war in the Middle East will begin with the Israeli-Arab conflict, the Antichrist um, is successful at defeating the Islamic Mahdi and he will be, uh, the scripture says that he will be killed by someone close to him. So he doesn't die in battle or anything like that. Someone who is close to him in his inner cabinet is going to do him and either poison him or kill him or either someone in his family or, you know, someone close to him is what the Bible indicates. But it talks about how the Islamic Mahdi and the Antichrist will sit at a table and lie to each other and these things. It, it, it's so precise about the times that we're living in. It's absolutely fascinating. 
anyone who studies the Bible and can see, oh my gosh, you know, we look at all of this prophetic fulfillment that's happening right now. Um, the Bible is such an amazing book. If you haven't picked it up and studied it, you should because, oh my goodness, it's so precious and wonderful and valuable. It should be in a castle out in a, the middle of the sea with a moat dug around it and a dragon guarding it and, you know, sought by mighty men and coveted by kings and and all of these things. But we tend to devalue it in our minds because we all have a copy. You know, God has been gracious to us and made sure that we all are able to have a copy. And so we... I guess it causes us to take it for granted and not think about how precious the Word of God is, how millions of lives have been given to assure that it is in our hands now. It, God has preserved His Word for us purely over thousands of years, dozens and dozens of generations, and if we're wise, we will study and pay attention and care about the message that the Lord Jesus Christ has sent to us. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Let me look in the chat room and see what my what my name is here for the producer. Um. I think I had to come in with a temporary name. Oh, that's me. I just posted in the in the chat room there, Troy. Producer. Uh. Are we done? Already? My two hours is up? Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, well. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in to our debut show of uh, Believer's Central World Update. I love you guys. Hope to see you again tomorrow.